Good morning. Good morning. Everybody can hear me? Uh -huh. Thank you for inviting me to No One Go Friday. I wish my mom were here. I'd be like, see, Mom, you can't get a paycheck doing what I do for a living. So <laughs> I'm glad that you're all here. Today is also kind of a talk. Uh, what, what's a day in the life of a gastroenterologist like? Uh, I know people know we're doing procedures all the time. Uh, as gastroenterologists, we spend really half of our lives in a clinic setting seeing patients. The other half is, is spent doing some type of procedure. And I thought, well, we'll touch on a number of the services that are offered here by the gastroenterology service at St. Agnes. If at any time during the presentation you have a question, please stop me. Uh, otherwise, at the end, I'll certainly take any questions uh, that you may have. It's fitting, too, that this is March. March is Colon Cancer Awareness Month. So every year in March, you'll hear radio ads. You'll hear uh, there'll be newspaper print ads. There'll be talk shows that we do all to, all to spread awareness about colon cancer. Uh, although the numbers are getting better, we're still going to diagnose uh, probably 350,000 colon cancers this year. Uh, roughly 125,000 people will lose their lives to colon cancer. Now, the good news is, is since we've started doing mass screenings over the last 10 years, we have seen uh, the rates of, of people dying and passing from colon cancer decreasing. So I think we're on the right track, but there's uh, a lot of work to go. And, I'll do everything I can to dispel any fears that people may have about a colonoscopy. Next slide. Uh, our team of uh, gastroenterologists, uh, myself, Dr. Kylis, and Dr. Slindy, that's 41 years of uh, practice right there. We've all been here for quite a while. Prior to the, this organization having uh, gastroenterologists, the surgeons did the procedures, uh, and there are still six general surgeons that do do a fair uh, number of endoscopic procedures in the GI lab. You might not know that uh, the pul both pulmonologists, that's where they'll do their bronchoscopy uh, scopes into the lungs is up in the GI lab. You, you need to have a, a negative a pressure system or room so that you don't spread infection outside of there. When we built the GI lab in about 2001, we thought that was where we had the, the best room capability to build that negative pressure room. So that's where all the bronchoscopies have done since that time. I'm very proud of the, the staff of the GI lab. You know, for three doctors, you think, geez, they have 25 support people. And, and that's really what it takes in order for us to have a very well-oiled, efficient system. Um, when, you, when you're doing a gastroenterology, you're doing the same procedures over and over and over, and, and you need to become extremely proficient, and that, and that helps the, the patient has less time to feel vulnerable, and, and just we get the procedures done. Uh, the patients, we hope, are, are in and out uh, quickly, and it's as minimal a disruption to their day as possible. But we have 17 RNs, two LPNs, uh, four CNAs, and uh, one operator uh, front unit person. And next. And there, the gray hair attests 41 <laughs> years of experience uh, sitting right there as of a couple weeks ago. Uh, when when we designed the GI lab, we designed it so that you would walk in the front door and that we could go in a circular route one way or the other to increase through fare, meaning that we never had to retrace patient steps, that we could admit into one room, get their paperwork done, admit them into the system, bring them into the procedure room, do the procedure, out the other side of the procedure, and then into one of the 10 to 20 recovery rooms that we have uh, to recover for an hour or so before they go home. All of our uh, rooms generally, for the most part, have their own private baths. They have um, TVs, they're very comfortable for the hour or two that you're going to be spending there. It, it just the, we have, I think, about 46 working instruments at any one time. And Kim here is washing a scope. The instruments, uh, whether we use them or not, all have to be washed to a high level of sterile disinfection once a week. And so that's, we actually probably have two people whose sole occupation, the nurses will take turns doing it, 
but that's all they do is, is clean instruments day in and day out. I mean, it's a lot of volume that, that passes through those doors. The procedures that we do here, um, the, the most common ones are going to be colonoscopies or a look at the, through the large intestine. And then the second would be upper endoscopy. Now we also do a number of niche procedures that may make us different uh, from other GI labs. Uh, I do something called radiofrequency ablation, Dr. Kylis and I do, and that's a, a treatment where we now for the first time can eradicate or destroy somebody's Barrett's esophagus, which we're gonna talk about later, and Barrett's esophagus is a precancerous condition of the esophagus. Esophageal cancer month is next month in April, so maybe I'll come back and do April talk too. Uh, we also do, uh, not every GI center does this, we do a fair number of uh, what's called an endoscopic retrograde uh, cholangiopancreatography, ERCP. That is a procedure where we go up into the bile ducts and we oftentimes are doing this in association with somebody having their gallbladder removed or sometimes we're treating cancers of the bile duct or pancreas and sometimes we'll use a procedure like this. We can, if there's been a complication after a gallbladder removal and, and a bile duct has been injured or a clip has been displaced, we can save a patient um, a, a second operation by going in there and, and, and being able to do what we do with the scope. Uh, all of the procedures that we do there, there, there's no, if everything is gone, right? There's never an incision on anybody's tummy. Everything is done through the mouth or another orifice, and, and uh, so uh, people are always told you, you won't wake up with any scars from when we're done. Uh, um, about 10 years ago, capsule endoscopy came out, and we will show uh, one of those today. That is a, a large vitamin-sized pill that actually takes two photographic, high-definition photographic images per second. And that allows us to look at somebody's small intestine uh, and other areas of the intestine that we really can't reach very well with the scope. And um, that, that's useful to, to look for obscure sources of bleeding, abdominal pain, and certain types of cancers. Endoscopic ultrasound is simply ultrasound that is affixed on the end of a scope. It allows us a very high definition view of a tumor uh, so that we can more accurately stage that uh, for our friends in the cancer center before somebody would undergo surgical treatment or chemotherapy. Esophageal motility, and these again are all studies that most GI labs will do. We, I think, do have uh, what I view as top-notch equipment in all of these areas. Um, esophageal motility is a way that we can measure the pressures within somebody's esophagus. Uh, there are certain diseases where people lose the ability to have their esophagus contract and sometimes bef before you know Dr. Stanley or Dr. Reynolds or Dr. Mullen would do a surgery to fix somebody's heartburn, they'll need to know that somebody's esophagus swallows well uh, and it's not going to be a problem after surgery. Uh, Bravo pH study is a little computer chip that we'll put in the esophagus and we'll show you examples of all of these later where it allows us to determine the pH in your esophagus for a 48 hour period of time while you're just wearing a belt pack and going on with your normal life. All of these things, you know, five years ago used to be wired procedures. You had wires coming out of your nose, wires going down to the belt, and people really would just sit in a chair and do nothing for the next 48 hours, and you really don't get a very good test result. Now that everything is a wirelessly transmitted procedure, we can do these things and people will go on with their normal life, so I think we can get much better estimates as far as is this the source of somebody's chest pain when they're known not to have any heart disease, is it because they're having bad reflux? And next slide. Right now, um, the GI lab does about uh, 6,000 to 6,500 cases per year. Um, most, uh, this is last year's data. We did uh, 3,800 colonoscopies and about 2,300 upper endoscopies. On average, when you look at day in and day out, the GI lab does about 30 procedures per day, that, or 30 different patients are admitted and discharged through the GI lab. We start doing procedures at generally about seven in the morning and then uh, really don't close up shop until five o'clock or later whenever the last ones are done. Um, and I think if we can go to our next, uh, 
Now some of these things, I'm going to just show you um, some slides of some things. You can just hold it for when you get there. Um, about what we're actually doing. And, and because for patient confidentiality, I get all my videos off YouTube because they're not protected and they don't show anybody's names. So if this is disgusting to anybody, look down and uh, <laughs> it'll be over in a few seconds. Uh, what you're looking at is a large polyp in the colon. And that is, you know, certainly we're magnified here. In real life, that is probably a little bit bigger than walnut size, okay? It's not grapefruit size, okay? So, you know, the only reason we even have grapefruit is so people can have something to compare the size of their tumor to, okay? <laughs> so if anybody says they had a polyp the size of a grapefruit, they, that's wrong. Um, how, do, how do we get a polyp? You know, a polyp starts out as two genetically imperfect cells, and all of us have genetically imperfect cells. Our bodies have a great system of policing these cells and taking them out of existence. But with breast cancer or with colon cancer, we have two cells that are imperfect and those two cells become four cells. These four bad cells become eight cells. And for some reason, our body's genetics that are supposed to be able to detect and remove these cells, it slips through the cracks. And there are, we get more and more of these cracks as we age partly because of uh, genes that we're born with, genetic barriers that we hit during life, foods that we eat, all of those decrease our body's uh, ability to fight off these cancerous cells. The, the, it's actually pretty well designed data. We know that it takes about 12 years from the time a polyp starts until you get a colon cancer. This is a polyp that is probably in that 10 year range, okay? Now the one good thing about having a long time frame is that it gives us plenty of time to go in and do a colonoscopy and remove a polyp before it becomes cancer. I, I would say 95% of the colon cancers that we diagnose upstairs are going to be in somebody's very first colonoscopy when they've never had one before. You know, we'll get people that come in in their 60s and 70s for a first procedure. Or when, and, and you cannot wait until you have symptoms. If you wait till, yeah, I have blood in my stool or I'm having belly pain or weight loss, more than likely it's too late and the disease has progressed. You know, you wanna, hopefully we catch these. This is still a very treatable disease because even if there is uh, cancer in this part of the, of the polyp, it's, you're gonna see it's on a long stock and, and there won't be cancer in that area. So now we're just gonna let this roll through a little bit. Okay. Now what uh, they are doing, that blue root loop is around, is around the polyp and that's called an endocinch. And that is a device that we can just basically choke off the blood supply to it so we know it's not gonna bleed all over when we're done taking it out and let it run. Yeah, just, just go ahead and let it run. Okay, go to the next, yeah. Okay, so now that we're actually, now you've passed a wire, okay, so that's the blue loop that's gonna choke off the blood supply to this thing, and now if you forward to our next Great. And now if you right here what you're seeing, this braided wire actually is a lasso that goes around the polyp and it's going right onto the neck area of it. And now you're going to pass cautery through it and you're going to cut that polyp off so you can let it run. And um, this is a, a very typical and stop it. That's that's how we remove a polyp. Okay, so now this polyp, we, this is too big to remove with the scope. A lot of times small polyps will just suck through the scope into a collection system. This one we have to drag out. But what I wanted to show you here is, you know, this big polyp, that's all you're left with is that little divot there. In a, in a one week's time, you won't even be able to see that. In fact, oftentimes we will 
people can get their first tattoo with us at any time because we'll inject ink into the wall so that we can always find that area so people can get inked in our division as well. Um, the, the base here is normal tissue. Uh, there, if, this, if there is cancer there, this person's now cured with just the colonoscopy. Um, in, a, in a period of a, there's a small risk of bleeding after a, a big polyp like this has been removed. That risk goes on for about uh, 10 to 14 days total, okay? And so that was, uh, that was a polyp being removed. Thank you, that worked nice. Je this is uh, our scope blocker, and it looks like we've got some things out for repair. Uh, all the instruments are expensive. They have to be... Does that clip that you put in there, does that just stay there? Does it dissolve? It, no, what'll happen, that clip, as the, um, that little butt end that we saw sticking out, that will retract into the wall of the colon, and as that retracts back in, it will push off that, that nylon clip, and then you will pass that out, and you'll probably never see it. Thank you. Um, yeah, so anything like that, please ask, because sometimes I forget. I don't know where these things end up, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, we usually will, have, will start doing procedures at age 50. Now, African American, the recommendation is to start at age 45. They have higher incidence and, and actually, for unknown reasons, have worse characteristics as far as the time of presentation and have a worse response to treatment. So everything leads to a starting sooner. Um, procedures are usually done every five to 10 years, and it depends on if we're finding polyps or not. Uh, it is an outpatient procedure. It is generally done with moderate sedation, uh, but can be done all the way up to general anesthesia. Very rarely do we have to give people general anesthesia. We do do many, many cases, probably 5 to 8 percent of our colonoscopies are done with uh, the assistance of the anesthesia service. Uh, and they, with the concoctions they use, can keep people absolutely comfortable if, if needed. Uh, if uh, any polyps are removed, it's usually about five to seven days before you would have uh, either an appointment or a letter from the group saying what the polyps showed and when we need to do this again. And next slide. Uh, a little bit of history. Uh, Dr. Harumi Shinya was at uh, Columbia New York University. He came here from Japan. He was actually already a neurosurgeon in Japan, but he wanted to leave Japan and come to the United States. He couldn't get any type of fellowship in neurosurgery, so he accepted one in internal medicine and gastroenterology. When he got here, uh, a research project that he was working on was Olympus, the same Olympus that makes your cameras, had developed an, uh, a fiber optic upper endoscope. And, and back in the day, a fiber optic scope contained about, oh, 100 bundles of just uh, very small diameter flexible glass rods encased uh, in vinyl and then light would shine through one end and it was kind of like a, a kid's periscope and that it allowed you to, to see around corners and through something and he started playing with that to see if he could manage to work this in the colon. Um, now it didn't hit the mass market until probably mm, 77, 78 uh, the surgeons here, Tom Carlson and Tom Freeman, who many of you, you may know, they were the first doctors that did colonoscopies here. And I talked to Carlson yesterday, and he said he thought it was in 85. But that's, uh, I kind of am into history. Uh, let's see. Let's see. The song in 1970 would have been Lola by the Kinks. <laughs> It would have been come together by the Beatles. Those would have been, uh, oh, and Stairway to Heaven would have started a couple months later. So that takes you back. You think that's old. Last night, you want to see a bunch of old people, go to a Bob Seger concert. I, I went last night, and it's like, okay, where is the assisted living vans? Where are you hiding? Yeah. Right? Because, and, and Bob's like, I bet you don't remember how old that song was. Uh, it was 1968. 
what some of his old music was from, and it's like, oh my God, when did we all get old? <laughs> when I first started here, we had two dinky procedure rooms, and um, th there wasn't even enough room in those two rooms. You could, you had to take the, the patient's gurney out in the hallway and turn it around and then put it back in because there wasn't enough room to, to spin the beds. We had to be done and out of here. The dictation station was an old telephone booth. Okay, I don't know if anybody remembers that. We had to be out of here by 5 o'clock because Narcotics Anonymous had meetings on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So they, the day had to be done by then, and we had to have all the patients out of there so they could come in and have their meeting. Between every case, the nursing staff had to wheel the patient down to the old OR recovery area, and we figured it was like a 200-yard round trip. And so everything would just come to a grinding halt between each case. Uh, Jim, you've got to remember yeah. <laughs> um, now, uh, when, when we built this, and up until a few years ago, and it probably was the same, we had the largest GI area outside of Milwaukee. Uh, it had six procedure rooms. Um, I guess that's still the case now. You could say, hey, maybe seven. Uh, it gave us the ability to do, uh, have 20 patient recovery beds and uh, allows us to, to do many more procedures than we could back in the day such that we now can do, you know, 30, 35 procedures a day. That, that's a, 35 is a long day, but uh, we have days like that. Uh, next slide. People are always worried about, you know, is this colonoscopy going to hurt? And what it will always tell people, you know, it's not the procedure. The procedure is the piece of cake. The bowel prep is not much fun at home, and you kind of have to push yourself on that to keep drinking, even though you're feeling bloated and terrible, and I can't drink, I hate Gatorade, I hate Jell-O. Um, but the procedure part's easy. Uh, the, we're going to give you these fast, short-acting amnestic medications where, you know, our greatest compliment is when people wake up and we get the, are we going to start this yet? And it's like, we're all done. You're in your room. And, and patients don't remember any, any bit of it. And that's actually, we are always striving to provide the maximum amount of comfort. And I would say, you know, 99% of people don't, they're asleep through the whole thing. They don't remember anything. Um, some people actually prefer, I have several people that want to go to work and they don't want sedation, and it's a procedure that I can do without sedation if people say, you know, I, I don't want any of this medication in me. We do always offer uh, deep sedation and general anesthesia for those that are on a lot of other medications or have other complex medical problems that we're worried that they wouldn't be comfortable. Uh, we're certainly, any patient, we always encourage patients if they have any concerns about how they're going to be sedated to, to bring that up and talk to us or, or their primary provider and we'll, we'll always make accommodations for that. And next slide. Um, the, from one of the most important things is that bowel prep thing, how, how well do we clean out the colon. And that is something that we actually grade ourselves on, and I think in the future others are going to be grading us on, is, is how well these colons are prepped. We have a system that, that you know, we think is reproducible about how clean a colon is, because how clean a colon is determines how well I can see, how well I can find polyps, and how well I can save somebody from having complications of colon polyps. We will give you instructions uh, about days before. We usually put people on a lower residual diet, more liquid diet. Uh, there's always uh, telephone numbers on all of the paperwork. There's always a gastroenterologist on call. Usually at night when you're on call, you'll get at least a couple of phone calls about questions about bowel prep for the next morning. So always tell people there is always somebody on call if they have any questions about what to do with that or their other medications and just drink and drink and drink and drink and that's the most important thing with a bowel prep. And next slide. And it's, <clears throat> would you, you know, it's the difference between seeing on a snowy, foggy day and being able to see in bright sunshine when we're doing these procedures. And next slide. You know, we think um, if, there's a lot of different ways you can look at these numbers. I mean, you're going to have a 150, 125 to 150,000 deaths. We think that <coughs> we could definitely cut that down to, to only 30,000 if we were doing uh, a really good job with screening. You know, and despite the fact that this is the gold standard test <coughs> for diagnosing colon cancer, 
compared to mammography and, and other screening methods, typically in women, we're not doing as well. Uh, some studies are saying that we're only evaluating 60% of the people that we should. I, I think a lot of it's a grassroots effort. We've got to get out there and convince people that this is not a bad thing. And um, facilities like ours, they, they, there's no embarrassment to this. They do so many of them up there. I, I tell people, I doubt your butt's going to be the best I've ever seen. I doubt it's going to be the worst. <laughs> And there's 20,000 in the middle that nobody, yeah. So it, it is a piece of cake. And next slide. When we're doing an upper endoscopy, uh, we're kind of switching gears now. We're looking at the esophagus, stomach, and the duodenum down into the first part of the small bowel. And that is, uh, oftentimes we're looking for a disease called celiac disease. And I wanted to mention that briefly. Celiac disease is a very common, up to 5% of the US population has it. It's a disease where we can't break down wheat products, and uh, there is a celiac disease support group here at St. Agnes, and you may, and not a lot of people know that. Um, celiac disease in kids can cause anything from small size, short stature, diarrhea, anemia, uh, irritability, fatigue, doing poor in school, false diagnosis of ADHD, all that stuff has been attributed to celiac disease. In adults, celiac disease is, um, it's, it's, a, it's a big misnomer. It can be crampy, irritable bowel complaints. It can be, why did I have a compression fracture at 42 when nobody else in my family has bone issues? It can be, why am I losing my hair? Why am I gaining weight? Why is my thyroid not working? All of those are potentially causes for celiac disease. A, a trip to the dermatologist, oftentimes uh, a lot of skin conditions are, are related to celiac disease and oftentimes a dermatologist can just look at it and say, well, do you have celiac disease? I mean, very, very common disorder. Uh, other things that we're typically looking for are people who have chronic heartburn or reflux. Uh, probably about once a week we will have to come in and remove uh, a piece of swallowed something that gets stuck uh, in the esophagus. That's a very common procedure that we do when we're on call. We're also uh, doing many evaluations for abdominal pain. I feel bloated. I don't have uh, uh, much appetite. And then um, we also on, will place stints into the esophagus for uh, esophageal cancers. Um, I brought some stents around and people could just pass those around. Uh, those are a variety of metal, metallic stents that we use, a little bit bigger in size, but generally the same principle of what's seen in cardiology. Those, when, we, when you get them, if you, if you kind of stretch them and turn them, they get really narrow. Don't get your fingers stuck in there, because I'm, you see. <laughs> you go play in the Chinese finger trick, I'm leaving you. Um, they, they come wrapped up on a catheter really tight and then it's like uh, exploding chicken wire. As you pull the rip cord, all of a sudden the, the stent blows out and holds it in place and that's how you put in a stent. And uh, our next little video, please. This is going to be treatment of a bleeding ulcer. And what you can see right here is there's a pretty good pumper uh, in the stomach, and that's something that we would get called into, somebody passing a large amount of blood. Uh, and uh, in the old days, this was a trip to the operating room, and now uh, most cases are, are be able to be would treated with the endoscope. And to our next spot. Now, what you're seeing here is actually a metallic clip, and these are uh, there's. What we're going to do is we're going to reach down there and we're going to grab that bleeding area and we're going to fire off this clip. Again, that's quite magnified. That clip, when it's done here, is um, probably a sixteenth of an inch in diameter, maybe half an inch long. And uh, off to our next one. And, and that, so that's what it looks like when we have clipped a, a bleeding vessel. And, and we'll use clips. There's a lot of different ways and toys that we can use to stop bleeding. Clips are one method. Sometimes we'll inject medications. Um, 
Okay, sometimes we will inject medications, sometimes we will uh, cauterize and, and burn, and there are just several different ways, the clips being one. That clip will fall off in a couple of weeks. And next. Barrett's esophagus, as I mentioned, that is a, um, a precursor to uh, esophageal cancer. Typically what you're going to see is over time, people have reflux changes where you get these small ulcers there. Your esophagus is trying to protect itself uh, from the acid, so it starts to grow abnormal tissue in the esophagus, and that's that darker pink tissue. And then finally, after several years, that's an esophageal cancer. And that's what we're looking to prevent with all of our strategies to treat refluxes, trying to prevent people from getting to that point. Because at that point, options aren't good. It may be stenting. It may be a very big radical surgery that has a, a bad prognosis. Um, and next slide. You know, we think uh, average age when we diagnose people with Barrett's esophagus is 50 years over the they will have typically had about four to five years of steady four time a week heartburn. Those are, those are the times that we want to step in and, and offer endoscopic uh, treatment uh, or at least diagnosis. A lot of times by the time people hit 50, they really don't even have the same types of heartburn and reflux complaints that they would have had when they were younger. So the take home message is you don't ignore heartburn and you don't ignore difficulty swallowing. Those always need to be evaluated. Next slide. Now, the, how we diagnose Barrett's esophagus, the only, you, there's no x-ray test or anything. It has to be obtaining of tissue during a procedure. Uh, an upper endoscopic evaluation is much easier than a colonoscopy. It's a, roughly a five-minute procedure. Uh, you, again, you are sedated. You will always be able to breathe. Uh, you will have no recall of the procedure, much like a colonoscopy. People are always worried about coughing, choking, gagging, not being able to breathe. That does not happen at all uh, when we're doing an upper endoscopy. Reasons why we really need to look for Barrett's esophagus, when people have had this three to five year history of having acid reflux, or when there's a family history of esophageal cancer. The, what's real nice now is that uh, here we have the ability that we can get rid of this Barrett's esophagus. We have a very effective therapy called radiofrequency ablation that we started doing a couple years ago. And we've had really, I think, very good results and I'm always looking at expanding that, that service uh, because it's one that needs to be available and it's not universally available here. And next slide. And this is just a little cartoon that it's a uh, special balloon catheter, and next slide, that we put into position over this Barrett's esophagus. We run electricity through it, and the, what makes this system work is it only burns a very minimal depth into the esophagus. It's enough that we can burn all the precancerous cells out of the esophagus, but not so deep that we end up injuring the underlying esophagus or causing complications. All of the previous treatments, that was the biggest problem, is that it caused so many complications, I don't really think we solved anything. And next slide. Uh, is that something you have to retreat then after time? Typically what you'll do is you'll do procedures every 90 days. And it, it's taking me now on average about two, one to two treatment sessions before I can say I've got it all burned out of there. And then after we've gotten it burned out of there, it will be surveillance biopsies to just make sure all the tissue's gone. And that's something that's evolving in the industry and, and with what I do as far as how, and we are lengthening out the length of time as we become more comfortable in the U.S. that we've completely cured these people. And we are treating these people right up until the point of having esophageal cancer. So, I mean, we're doing pretty high-risk patients, yes. Uh, yeah. Dr. Evans, could you repeat the questions for our Wapai and Ripon? Is there a subset of patients who are not candidates for this procedure? You know, the, it is marketed, and this was like the first thing that was FDA approved the second that it came out. Be, because the prognosis of living with esophageal cancer is so terrible and we have no chemotherapy and our surgeries aren't good and our long-term survival is terrible, this was automatically approved. Um, 
right now, insurance companies are looking more favorably the worse dysplasia you have, the, the closer that you are to cancer. We've had some patients that would fit the criteria uh, for having the family history and the long segment and they're young men and young guys between the ages of 43 and 50 are the highest peaking group of esophageal cancer and it's a, it's a scary rise in how much that's going through the roof. I, in time, I, I think in five years, I think anybody who has Barrett's esophagus, I think it will now be that that's covered. I, I think I'm going to look at this like colonoscopy and at first you had problems getting colonoscopies covered. Over time that's gotten easier and easier. I think over time it will for Barrett's, but right now uh, if you had no dysplasia and it was a short segment, some insurance companies are not, are not going to pay for it. The other thing, there is data, and this needs to get out there. If this works as well as we're saying it will, it becomes cost effective for us to remove the Barrett's rather than us to just keep looking every few years and double checking and double checking and never doing anything to get rid of it. Is this the HALO procedure? That's the HALO okay. procedure. That's the, the trade name, so I didn't use it. Uh, there's now one going to be called, it's a cryotherapy one, which if you failed HALO, we would freeze it out. And that, that's next on the horizon. Moving on to ERCPs, and I can pick up the pace here. Th this is a test that we use to diagnose and treat diseases of the pancreas, liver, bile ducts. Uh, it gives us a way that we can get up into the bile duct and remove a stone. That's the most common reason we do it. Uh, oftentimes we might be opening up a, a blocked bile duct or placing some type of drain. Um, typically patients would come in yellow and jaundiced. Um, that's the procedure that we're doing. Uh, we don't do as many of those as I like. Um, probably do 150 a year, something like that, on a good year. The next slide. Uh, capsule endoscopy, and we're going to pass a capsule around, and everybody can look and hold and touch that. It's just the, the white part, not the blue part. The patient swallows that, and it takes two images per second. It's a, a high-def camera that the battery pack in the, in the pill lasts for about eight hours. And so I'm going to get 60,000 images all the way from the nurses taking pictures of themselves before you swallow it <laughs> to other stuff you don't want to hear about. To and you don't have to recover that and bring it back to me, okay? It, when it goes, it's done. And all of those images are relayed wirelessly to a, a, a battery pack, and then we sit and watch a movie about what it looks like. And the reason we're doing it, it allows us to look at your small intestine. It allows us to look for conditions of low blood count, cancers, things that we can't see when we do a scope procedure because there's too much small intestine in the middle we can't reach. Okay. And, and this is an ulceration, a circumferential ulceration. That's what you might see with Crohn's disease. A lot of medications cause ulcerations of the small intestine. This patient had been anemic for a long period of time, requiring blood transfusion. So this is a way that we can, that you're not going to see on any type of CT scan or any other imaging studies, so. And next slide. Endoscopic ultrasound, uh, that gives us the capability to do uh, fine, um, high quality detection on growth to, to, to try to determine as accurately as we can the stage of disease at the time of diagnosis so we can best have the best treatment available, whether that would be surgery first or whether chemotherapy first and radiation first. It depends on how well and how accurately we can stage. So a lot of these diseases, you don't want to put somebody through a huge surgery if you knew that there was no chance you were going to cure it. And patients need to have the ability to make that decision. Endoscopic ultrasound helps us do that. And next slide. Um, we do do motility studies and that's to help to evaluate the motor abnormalities of the esophagus, those are uncommon conditions, uh, but we do have uh, all the um, necessary equipment that we can do high quality studies in that area as well. Next. Um, a Bravo pH monitor, Marge is going to pass one of those around and that is a kidney bean sized P 
pH probe that I can attach into your esophagus and it's going to give me pH readings in your esophagus for the next 48 hours. And that allows us to try to determine why you have chest pain. It allows us to determine why uh, you know, our heartburn medication is not working for you. That's quite an advancement over what it used to be when we have to have wires going through the nose and, and a belt pack. You know, that people uh, uh, could do their normal activities. And that actually, the little, be the little brown bean thing on the end of that, that actually gets snapped off onto the esophagus. Next slide. And uh, all that you're left with is this little kidney bean shaped thing that's attached to the esophagus. That will stay attached for about 10 days and then that falls off, passes in your stool. Next slide. And that takes us to the end. Does anybody have any questions about anything? How soon would we uh, screen if somebody has had uh, gastric or esophageal erosions? Would be generally in five years. And, and that's mainly because the, the medicines that we use are so effective in, in shutting off the acid in the stomach. And the acid does do some good things. So we just want to make sure that people aren't developing Barrett's changes or other bad things right under our noses while we were treating them with these very potent medications. We didn't talk about it today, but there's now been some kickback that some of these medications like the Prilosex, the Nexiums, the Omeprazoles, the Prevacids, that those really have some bad side effects. And um, I, I think there's a concern that we need to be careful uh, when we're using these, even though they're available over the counter. People can, can do a lot of damage. You know, especially the rates of hip fracture, compression fractures, things like that are so much higher when people are taking them. Any other questions? Yes. What is your take on food as far as organic food? I'm sorry, I'm too much noise up here. Your take on organic food. Your take on organic food. You know, yeah. Um, you know, I know organic foods are not standing up Really, a, a few months ago, they found no changes as far as health quality, things like that. Um, yeah, I, I think people who eat poorly, I mean, we can say people that there's a correlation between high fat diets and colon polyps, high fat diets and reflux, and high fat diets and esophageal cancer. So I guess that's the eating well does pay from that standpoint. Now, You know, we, we use a lot of probiotics for many different conditions, and um, I, I think they're very useful. Um, there are several varieties out there. Some people like what's in yogurt. Some people like um, uh, the many different varieties you can buy. Um, I, I, they definitely have benefit, and uh, we use them a lot more now than we did five years ago. Okay, yep. So we thought what we have, Jim has been so kind to volunteer. We have an Olympus training model that Jim is going to try to do a colonoscopy on. Go Jim. And I don't know, how many golfers in here? How many people bet on the golf course? If you're not going to bet on the golf course, don't play. So what we're, the bet is, if Jim can get to the end of the colon in three minutes, I'll write a big check to you on behalf of you guys' name for some program of your choice. If Jim can't get to the end of the colon in three minutes, then Steve Little is going to buy you all a water bottle. Okay? So we, got a, we have a monitor here, got gloves, we got the plastic bum insert, <laughs> and the fi the f we ready to go? We're going to get some gloves on. You want to cheer me on, Jim? Let's stay quiet. You can cheer me on. This is your large jersey. This is your large jersey.
yes, it is ready to go. Um, I believe it's there. A little lubricant. You need some more. Now, you can't believe how many tens of thousands Olympus would spend on developing a training model. And, and you can put in all sorts of trip ups to make it harder. Now, we've taken them all out, so this is as easy as it gets. Now, the. The wheels on there, Jim, the small one can t makes your left-right movement. The bigger wheel does up-down, okay? <laughs> so who's my timer? Are you my timer? What should we give him? Three minutes, four minutes? What do you think? Three? Three? Okay. <laughs> what do the wheels do? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, so the wheels... Yeah. So there, if you look it up on the screen, there you can see, see what you're looking at there, okay? Okay. okay. And then you and just advance it with your hand. Then you advance with your hand, oh, and then you use the wheels. To visualize. To visualize, okay? Gotcha. Okay. There you go. Oh, oh, no. oh. oh now you got it flipped over. I don't know what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, they're, they're sedated, so. Yeah, they're sedated. <laughs> you eat with those hands? <laughs> Lord. Oh, no, you're doing great. Remember I said 99% of people are well sedated for this procedure? Yeah. 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 <laughs> now to be fair, he's using it, there's two techniques, the way I do it, and then there's the force, and that's what he's doing. <laughs> Following the force. Yeah. I know somebody... Lots, yeah, yeah. We got those taken out. Yeah, I'll, I'll be. Uh, I'll get you up a little ways, and yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little help here. Maybe, maybe it's broken. Okay, there's problem number one. There we go. Oh, wow. There's the... Christ, I can't even do this. Okay. All right, Jim. There we go. There, I put you up three quarters of the way. Okay. There you go. Now you're seeing. And if you if you're looking at a red wall, back away. Yeah, Marge, help him out there. Make the colon fit him. Ring, ring, ring. 